Yes, yes, folks, how you doing here for another edition of Man of Real, uh, Man of Real's Reviews. How are you? All good. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about Venom 3, Venom The Last Dance. It's been out a little while now. I went to see it with my friend Sam. Big up to Sam, who loves the Venom series. But did she and we love this new one? Find out after the bit. Let's get real. Eddie Brock and Venom must make a devastating decision as they're pursued by a mysterious military man and alien monsters from Venom's home. Well, okay, so here are all the reasons that Venom The Last Dance shouldn't work. One, it feels like a 90s Friday Night at the Pictures throwback. Two, it's an outrageous and over-the-top film that takes huge dramatic and otherwise swings. Three, it's pure Hollywood big film fun in its pretensions. Four, it's got a really cute kid in it, the type you'd only find in a cheesy Hollywood movie. Five, it's silly, very silly in fact, all the way through. Six, there is a sexy green alien with boobs in it. And here's the thing, most films with these ingredients usually simply fail. Think the original Super Mario movie, think Wild Wild West, think Battlefield Earth, think that Donnie Wahlberg movie where he's immortal, also starring Chiwetel to Edge of Four, think the mummy starring Tom Cruise, there's a lot of them. But then there are the precious few that, despite similar pretensions of telling a well-worn story, somehow manages to make said story memorably entertaining and potentially enduring. I'm thinking about things like Roadhouse, Anchorman, Love Actually, Taken, The Holiday, Boss Level, and this year's Jason Statham's The Beekeeper, which I reviewed, by the way. Films that got slated and slighted upon release as they're easily mixed with every other subpar film that came out that same year. Worth talking about films that simply shouldn't work, but do. So if you've made it this far, you're probably wondering the one simple question. Why does it work? And you'd be in luck, because I'm about to tell you. One very, very obvious answer is Tom Hardy who I still don't feel truly gets the respect for the genius level performances he delivers in these films. This is awards worthy stuff. A juvenile alien child bonkers performance with heart that due to the casing of its commerciality won't ever get the same respect as say a Cillian Murphy in Oppenheimer. When I hear Venom, I never hear Tom Hardy. One man creating two distinct performances pinging off of each other. An on-screen coupling that you super care about, played by one man, is no mean feat. The other reason is that this film really does know what it is. The writer of Venom 1 and 2, Kelly Marcel, who also directs this one, really understands the tone and so is able to run with it thoroughly, whilst never losing track of the story. So it's wacky and outrageous, definitely, yet faithful and disciplined. Also, lack of pretension and pure crowd-pleasing fun is, in the right hands, gold. And Kelly Marcel understands this. Most films, after all, that get that critical love go worthy. Think Dune 2, Twisters, A Quiet Place Day 1, or Civil War. But this film goes fun. Also, all the support in this are on point and give committed, tone-perfect performances that add value. To Chiwetel Ejiofor, to Juno Temple, to Riss Eifens, to, surprisingly, Stephen Graham, who I, as well as every other audience member who'd seen Venom 2, thought had snuffed it. I think pure popcorn crowd-pleasers are the hardest to pull off, but the most rewarding when done. Right, Star Wars just might be the best example of this. A film with a seven-foot dog pilot, Muppets, and a trash-talking, snotty gold robot. A film unafraid to show all its shades. From goofy, to swashbuckling, to philosophical, to emotional, to giddily epic. But, crucially, always popcorn. Venom The Last Dance may not be Star Wars A New Hope, but it similarly has a lot of dimension to it, and deceptively so. I think that this just might be the most complete of the three Venom films, personally. The third act in the first film was a little meh. And I just wasn't really feeling Woody Harrelson's story arc and performance potentially as carnage in number two. I laughed, I was thrilled, and I was moved at what is a surprising film, considering at the centre of it is just a dude talking to himself. Two thumbs up from me. But what did you think? Did you like it? My friend Sam loved it. She uh, said she was going to go and see it again. Did you go and see it again, Sam? Yeah, I thought it was the best of the series as mentioned. Yeah, I think that these will be cheesily fun, enduring films that people pull out time and again because 
they start well and they end well. I wasn't too keen on the one in the middle, but um, the second act can be a little bit weaker if, if it starts and ends well. And I really do feel, feel like this one did. Tom Hardy, yeah, is the show. I think also uh, the director also and the writer also is the show. And it seems like they're really tight and it seems like they together produce gold. It'll be interesting to see what they do going forward and what they come up with in the Venom universe or otherwise. That's it from me, folks. What did you think? Leave your comments below. Where do you think Venom should go next in the universe or in the Marvel universe or in the Sony universe? Give me all of your thoughts regarding Andrew Garfield, perhaps Tobey Maguire, perhaps uh, Miles Morales. Where do you think it should go? Currently, I kind of have no idea and it feels like a full stop-ish, kind of. But at the same time, it's a Marvel movie, so there's never quite an actual full stop, full stop, if you get my meaning. Till next time, folks. Love, peace, Afro-Grease. Mandeville out. Boom.